Hello, Wendy. Hello, how are you? Wonderful. We really yeah, good, good start. I'm glad everybody was able to um, finally get on. That was rough. It's a little stressful and we're still, we're still missing a couple people who are still struggling. So, well, hopefully they'll be able to join us. That We are recording, however. Um, all right, well, welcome everyone to Breakout Room 1. So, yes, yeah, so we've got a, a rather challenging question. We'll be thinking about some of your thorniest leadership dilemmas and reflecting on Wendy's presentation about how leaders deal with these multiple conflicting obligations. So what was the most challenging leadership challenge that you all faced in your careers? And how did you respond to this? That'll be our reflection in this group. And what we, what we want to assure you and assure each other is that what is in this room, what, what you share stays among this, with this group. Um, my hope is that you will be um, reflective um, and willing to um, uh, invite others in um, to the process that you went through to resolve this ethical dilemma. So who would like to begin? I hear, Bruna, I saw a hand coming up from the bottom of the I hear, I hear a child who's wanting to be part of this conversation. Yes, I, I was actually hoping like somebody else would share because it's a very tough question. It is a tough question. And, um, but it was very reassuring that you start with this. So one of the, I think one of the biggest challenges uh, for me, uh, where I work especially because I'm not there for a very long time, is, is how slow change actually is. Mm -hmm. So you might have everything which is, um, you know, the, the community that you work with is involved, the decision is benefiting them, and it has been confirmed by themselves that it is going to benefit them. But when, when there is something new in the public service, it is so hard to get it accepted by, by people. And I, uh, strangely, because, Mauritius being so multicultural, uh, to be honest, there's a lot of underlying racism, but you don't face it uh, very much uh, in, you know, I've, I've, I've lived a, a rather, I would say, protected life in, in, in a way. So when you start wanting to challenge structures that already exist and want to implement new projects, it's hard because suddenly you, you realize that everything that so far was an advantage suddenly turns into a disadvantage. So for example, the first thing that they're going to tell you is, uh, you are so young, this is how it's been forever. So why do you think this could work, et cetera? And maybe I can give you like a very uh, short example. So um, I am, I, I've been a Toastmaster for um, six years uh, approximately. And at one point we wanted to, so Toastmasters is this uh, public speaking club, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, very popular uh, elsewhere. And in Mauritius, it's catching up slowly. So at one point um, I, I worked for the Mauritius Police Force. So I was uh, trying to sell this idea that, you know, public speaking is a very big part of police officers' lives because they need to talk to public and sometimes interviews, et cetera. So everybody agreed that this is a great idea, but the moment you write a proposal, you get, it was approved by the commissioner of police himself. And even then it was very hard to convince people that, you know, come join this club because a lot of them found that like, you know, why would we want to do extra work mm -hmm. and we're not getting paid for that or we're, we have to stay back, etc. So I'm still working on it. There's a very small group that to a certain extent have accepted and are looking forward to it but a lot of the other people strangely uh, they don't want to join uh, they're not interested but they don't want it to happen either so for them in a way it's like if this happens it's going to challenge something which is very traditional which has existed mm -hmm. since it's, it's very strange in a way and I really don't know how to face that kind of a mindset because sometimes um, you know, it's very different in the sense that they're going to tell you, yes, yes, go for it, etc. But then they're not very keen on paper or they're not very keen in the field to make it happen. Yeah, that's a that's a tough one. And that whole issue of being an agent of change um, brings us into um, 
uh, interaction with having to grapple with um, people's fears um, of new things, um, a fear, I think particularly uh, many people have grown up with um, a fear of public speaking. So they're also having to grapple, you know, with their own insecurities and, and sense of uh, incompetence, right? Um, because most of us um, take, and I would think that in a paramilitary organization, this would be even more true, um, take great pride in being competent. It's a, it's a big uh, part of being um, a respected leader, right? Mm -hmm. So if I reveal my mm -hmm. incompetence um, uh, about public speaking, um, it makes me vulnerable in a way that makes me uncomfortable. So that, that uh, my guess is that's at the heart of it. So for you, Sharuna, what is your, what's the dilemma for you? Do you, what sorts of belief systems are you seeing um, uh, colliding? Um, I think the, the main thing would be being open to learning and having this constant, in a way, uh, re-evaluation of your competence and skills. Uh, you know, for me, when I go to work, it's every day, you know, what can I learn from people? What can I learn from the environment? But um, I feel, especially for a, for a generation uh, of people, and it, it's, it's really wrong to generalize because I have seen a lot of people with many, many years of experience who are very open-minded, but frankly, it's a minority. So the majority really is that the moment they open, like you said, the moment they, they open themselves up to say that I need to build a new competence in that field, uh, suddenly the respect kind of goes down and you know they, they feel like in this hierarchy that they took so many years to build, suddenly they're not really at the top anymore. Yeah. So I think this would be like one of the biggest divergences that I've seen. And unfortunately, even in the younger generations, it's not everybody who's open to learning uh, from people with more experience, uh, from people you know, parallel to them, um, mm -hmm. up and down, et cetera. So I think this is what is really a very big weakness in the system because we have no choice. We, uh, you know, given the circumstances currently on the island, because it's so small, resources are so limited, we need to learn very fast and keep pace with the changes around us. And I think we have become very much obsolete since a long time, but there's a very big refusal to admit that, you know, some things are not really working anymore. It's a, that's a tough one. Thank you for, for sharing that, that um, dilemma that's, um, I, I think uh, arises often um, with leaders. Um, uh, any, any other, uh, uh, thoughts, um, examples of ethical mm -hmm. dilemmas that uh, you all have experienced um, on on the job. Can I take it from? Sorry, I I feel very poorly. So. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Which is the reason I haven't put my camera. I've been feeling poorly since yesterday. It's okay. Don't this worry. is just proof. So. Um, but I just wanted to take it up from what Sharuna had said, especially something I could relate to, which is growing up. Um, in a protected bubble and you take that for granted when you begin to do community service um, there are things that you have to deal with and i'll share something very personal which is one how i started my journey to community service and two i'll share also something i'll call like a real life daily i've never shared with anyone but i'll share it in this circle first is that um i grew up as a very shy concerned very afraid child and i got i'm doing public i'm doing community service as a calling because one of the things i know that i've been called to do and i know there's a gap i need to fill so i'm doing it out of um you know for me it's like fulfilling purpose so i had to do whatever it took to be there which is one stepping out of my comfort zone learning to speak up. I'm still working on it now because I still stutter. But what I do now is I just keep, I just keep talking. Even if I stutter in public, I just keep talking. And even if you, best you can say is just, sorry, I didn't hear the last thing and then I repeat myself. But I know I just have to keep doing it. But these are things, this is something I struggle with every day, every single day. Um, 
And sometimes people, I don't know if people see it as, a, I know people see it as a weakness, but I think that every day when I stand up to speak and my whole body is shaking and I'm dealing with anxiety or sweating, I see it as the, hard, the, the sacrifice I have to make, you know, the price I'm paying for what I have to do right now. So it's a lot of, a lot of work for me to do what I'm doing now. And it's one of, for people who know me and my background, they keep saying, oh, I, don't, I can't believe you're the one doing all of this now. Um, secondly, I'll share um, one of the biggest, um, if I call it like ethical dilemma, because it's a moral issue I had to deal with. In maybe a, two or three years ago, a cousin of mine called and said, oh, Adora, um, a friend of mine will call you so you guys can put, uh, you know, um, work, let's say work on a proposal together. And this friend calls, um, easy brief of the proposal to work on. Long story short, I found out that this is a random person who just wants to get a contract from the government. I wanted to use the NGO. And if you're coming from Africa, this might be the case for a lot of people. In Nigeria, is the case for people every single day. And I know people take this decision lightly. But I couldn't take it lightly because one, um, I'm a Christian. So I had to think of, you know, think of it both morally in terms of social standards and my Christian background, my faith. And I went on to do that proposal, but what I said to myself was, I would not let this person steal from the people. That was what I said, because it was a decision. I had to qualify what is what. If I did the proposal, maybe someone else, like main thing is I thought of it as good. First of all, the proposal is to do something good. Instead of just saying no outright, I had to think of it because you know, this that's what is a tough, as you said, is a dilemma, it's a tough decision for leaders to take in situations like this. Some would actually say no, some would just go ahead and already start thinking of the sharing plan, uh, money sharing plan with, uh, with the supposed partner. But I thought of it one, if we get this, it's good for the people, so for the target community. Secondly, I now have to draw the moral line. So I just said, I won't let him steal from the people. Mm -hmm. I said to him, I'm going to give you the real figures. You can inflate it all you like, and that's not on me. But I'll, you, when you get the contract, you're going to make sure you send the exact figures to do the, execute the project, because I won't be part of a non-executed project. So I'm just saying, of course, I'm saying this now, it sounds like, <laughs> it sounds like, it sounds easy, but it took a whole long time for me to come to this point. So that's why I wanted to share the personal experience. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's, I suspect that there are other people in this group who run into uh, the, those kinds of issues. And um, it, it, there's always that question about does the ends justify the means, right? And we have to kind of work our way through how we balance out. And, and a, an issue in there can also be um, uh, familial uh, relationships. And a sense of loyalty. That's a that's a, a basic moral um, principle is loyalty to family, helping friends, right? So what happens when um, helping a friend or a family member um, uh, runs counter to the public interest? What happens when somehow um, a decision that I'm making actually affects me financially? might benefit me uh, financially. Uh, what, how do we deal with that? Now, in some countries, um, certainly in the United States and individual states, we have conflict of interest laws that require um, me, for instance, if I'm making a decision that may affect me or a close family member financially, to, to, to recuse myself, at least declare it, if not recuse myself um, from the decision because of either the reality or the appearance of a conflict of interest. And I know from having worked with a, a number of folks um, on the continent that this matter of public corruption is um, uh, very, really troubling and, and rampant um, in a, a number of the governments. So um, before we move forward with this, who will be willing to um, step forward and report out for this group? Who, whoever that person is, I want to make sure that you're taking a few. Who's that? 
I no, I was just saying I, I'm not sure how much time we'll have because I think we're going to have a little longer in the breakout rooms than the original plan. But okay. we are all, we are all going to come back together as a group at the end. Okay. Frankly. Um. So yes, yeah, so if anyone from this group wants to volunteer to to just sort of generally share some highlights from this discussion, you can raise your hand. <laughs> and I can't promise we'll have a ton of time for it. But <laughs> does anybody feel? feel inclined. Piva, you just gave me a big smile and then your smile went away. So I might, <laughs> I might, I might call on you. Yeah. Like, that's okay. how I call on my students. Like, well, you did it. Yeah. You yeah. seem to make eye contact. So it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Piva, it sounds like you've been uh, volunteered. <laughs> I just made eye contact with you. On yeah. Skype, so. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Oh, yes. So, you know, uh, from Africa, especially like where we have had so many uh, experience when it comes to uh, corruptions and uh, frauds, and you find that most times uh, this is um, mainly in the public sectors. And for where I work, you will find that uh, even among uh, providing care for patients uh, where jobs even with the jobs, people try to respect these jobs for their relatives only because they see that uh, their relatives would need a job. But at times, uh, people who are needed more, and uh, even encountered a situation where uh, a higher government official uh, went there some uh, under TV jobs for a relative who uh, she felt that the, the person should not come for, the, for screening. And just to give it because that's what they suspected. So I was like, there are more people who need these jobs and at this facility. And I can't just give it because you are a government official, you just have to drop them to give it. And you have and one thing I, I see is uh, for the common good, you have to ask yourself less. You don't have to think about yourself because I could easily give the jobs to her. And like find favor with her and I'll be in the government area, maybe uh, in case of promotion, she could tip me. But uh, that's not the point. The point is what happens to those who are in need of uh, those jobs and need to take them. So, leader, you gotta be uh, selfless. And one thing that uh, I try doing in uh, my facility, especially with my team, I make sure I continuously bring information about corruption. The patients, especially because of limited resources, because of lack of salaries, we find that some healthcare workers who want to take uh, some funds for jobs that are supposed to be free. And um, I often tell them that these things, there will be repercussions. You have to keep having the as a leader, you have to set a good leadership that is giving the information on. Corruption that is bad, and uh, the end does not justify the means by any way. And also, you have to also have good governance. That is, you have quality that when you violate some of these, this is what will happen. This is the repercussion. This is what we will do for you. And uh, I think that has been working so far to some extent at my facility. I cannot boast of it in the entire country right now, uh, but. This is something that is happening. And as a leader, you have to be selfless and you have to keep preaching. The behavior change is a gradual process. Mm -hmm. And uh, we keep, you just have to keep breaking the information up so that at the more the year is, the more people will change. But it won't take one day, it won't take two days, it won't take a year. Uh, but I'm sure with the information, continuous information, you will always see the change. Thank you. We could only hear you sporadically, Piva, but what I uh, picked up on, I think, was right on, and the notion of uh, selflessness and um, and always keeping the um, common good at the center uh, of our decision making, and to be willing to call people on it when when they haven't done so, and and to um, have there be consequences. Uh, for violating uh, that public trust. Mm -hmm. I, th I think it's really important as public leaders for us to remember that the money that we're spending isn't ours. We are stewards um, of the public's
funds, however they come to us, whether it be through taxes or uh, levies or whatever. Um, so thank you very much for that. How are we doing on time? So I'm, I'm not sure when, when Wing Kai is gonna pull us back. So I don't okay. know, because he's in charge of these breakout rooms today. Um, so I think, you know, we should have time for at least one more fellow to speak yeah. and share your experiences. That would be like, wonderful. So Himwitwa, go ahead. Uh, good evening, everyone. Oh, it's evening here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> um, I also want to share my ex experience I had uh, at my place of work when I just joined. So, um, more frozen. Oh, you're still frozen. Hope you come back in a moment. Please come back. Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay. Uh oh. Maybe we should move to someone else, then we can come back to him. We talk. Let's, let's do that. She's looks like she's screaming. She's frozen. <laughs> okay. Oh, would someone else like to jump in? And then hopefully, Himwita, if you can hear us, uh, we can't hear you right now. You're frozen. So you can jump in when you're able to, to interact with us again. Um, or if you want to, if you're able to chat something, you can do that as well. Okay. So would someone else like to share while we're waiting for Himwita to come back? I think she's reconnecting. We'd love to hear from you. Mm -hmm. Come on, brave folks. Lenza, would you like to share? I can see, I can see your beautiful face, so I'm gonna pick on you. <laughs> that'll, that'll make you all want to turn your cameras off. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Hello. Hello. Yes, uh, my network is also not uh, performing well, but I'll, I'll say as much as I can. Um, I think one of my biggest ethical challenge I faced was uh, I worked in a disability mainstreaming education office and I, I myself have disabilities. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, one of the challenges I faced was my colleagues, they were very ableist. My clients themselves, uh, they were not because they were mainly children entering schools or children facing challenges because they've developed or learned they have a disability. But they are caregivers, they were very ableist. Uh, the biggest, the most, uh, I, I'd say humiliating experience was I had a terrible allergic reaction. And if you have those, you know, you shake for a few days and uh, I learned to write. I have been writing my whole life because the technology is very poor here. So you can't type in most places. That office was one of them. And I'd been writing and uh, because I was still shaking and I didn't know I was shaking to that extent, my handwriting was barely legible. And uh, one of my colleagues, uh, he, she, she took, she, 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 she jumped on that, told about 50 parents who are questioning disabilities that um, I'm incompetent, I'm incompetent because I'm disabled and uh, used that to launch into a year worth of harassing me. And when I would tell uh, my supervisors and uh, my more senior colleagues that, you know, this lady has been harassing me for at one, for once it was one month, two months, six months, months, nine months, they would say, but you know, it's true. I mean, you're blind. What are you doing here? People like you should be in other offices so that people who are not disabled should be in these offices. And uh, it resulted in me having to leave the office for about six months and uh, nothing was ever done to the lady. In fact, she was promoted to a, a very senior position and uh, she was applauded for, you know, being a, a spearhead of inclusion and all that. And, uh, and I was brought back at a less position that was so tentative that when the COVID came back, I, I was the first to go. And it, it was a very painful circumstance. And one of those cases where you realize no matter how good you are, if somebody bad is uh, seen as uh, the moral ground and uh, I'm a, he's, their bad action is seen as this is the good way to act, you will always... Uh, you'll always fail no matter how much you try. That's a, boy, that's a rough one. Did, did you, is there any place that you can report um, that kind of behavior to, uh, like an inspector general? I, I reported it to the National Council in my country for people with disabilities. 
and to the labor office in my country. And the National Council, they said there's nothing they could do. Um, the labor office, they said I should talk to the National Council. So it, it, it went like that. <laughs> oh boy. But that couldn't have been that couldn't have been easy for you to go to the National Council and make yourself vulnerable in that way and talk about what had occurred, knowing that they might not believe you. Did, uh, they that... did believe me because it's something that happens to a lot of people with disabilities. The problem is they are not, they're not empowered and interested in helping. So they believe you, they know it's happening to you, but they could not care any less. <laughs> yes. Oh dear. I'm so sorry you had that experience. You, if, yes. I, I have to say, I, I can't even imagine the um, amount of courage that it takes to, um, you know, to keep going forward when you're dealing um, with, with obstacles that um, other people are not. I just, you know, my hat's off to you for that. Yeah, and, and especially knowing that people that are so ableist are working with children with disabilities, right? That's gotta be difficult too, just to, to be concerned about that level of things. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and and Wichua, you were able to cut back in. Great. <laughs> you just you it was so sad. You just froze right when you started talking. So I'm gonna try again. I'm sorry. I think I had a, I had a connection problem. So um, I was talking about the experience that I had at my place of work when I just joined, because uh, I started working I think like three four months after university. So I was put in a row in a row that needed me to sort of like lead a group of women that were at least, all of them were about five years older than I was. So like uh, Sharuna mentioned earlier, I can kind of relate with uh, the challenges that she had because it was more of, you are coming with fresh ideas. You're coming with all these, um, all these things that you've learned from the university and you want to implement them. But um, here's a group of people that have their own bureaucracy. They, they have an idea of how things should work. So that was one of the challenges that I had. And then the other challenge was, um, I, I, they just didn't accept that someone young could come and take up that role, you know, take up that leadership role to give them tasks, to work with them. So um, how did I work? How did I work around that? What helped me was engaging because some of them felt like I came to take up their jobs, mm. you know, like um, threatened in Zambia. Yeah, they felt like I came to, to sort of like remove them from their positions or kind of like intimidate them. So I had to do a lot of engaging. I had to do a lot of engaging. I had to um, sit down with them, uh, bring out ideas and also listen to the ideas that they had. So you find that from there, um, because at first they used, they would get demotivated, they wouldn't work on tasks. Even when you tell them, oh, we need this report on such and such a day, they would just never work on tasks. It was, it was, it was really bad. But through engagement and interactive talks and also um, resolving conflicts, because it brought out some conflicts between me and them. Mm -hmm. So normally what I would do is when I find that um, I have a staff who's demotivated, I would call them in, I would ask them what the problem is, how are they, um, how, why do they, wh why are they demotivated? And others would actually openly come out and say, but why would the council bring someone young when we've been working here for 10 years and yes. we didn't get the role? Yeah. So uh, I would tell them to say, look, I'm not here to you know, take up your role, take up your job, but I'm here for us to work together so that we can improve the community, so that we can improve the society. And I noticed that that, um, that slowly, they started, slowly started, you know, uh, warming up to the idea. And so it's, 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 it's become better. It's, 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 it's better now because even when they want to, Maybe there's a program that they would want to implement. They would actually come to me and say, oh, okay, we're thinking of doing this. And then we'd put our heads together and it would work out. So that's, that's my short story. 
Yeah. That's, that's a that's a great approach in saying, you know, it's not about me, it's about the role and it's about the public interest, right? Because that that not only really sort of puts that, takes the pressure off you, but also really emphasizes that public message that you've been talking about throughout. Um, Surfred, did you want to jump in as well before we get, I don't know when we're going to get pulled out. So <laughs> Surfred, do you want to join in now? Oh, we have one Here minute. Here we go. One, one minute. minute. Basically, I wanted to bring in uh, a challenge that I'm facing, but from a different perspective. For most of my colleagues, it's about, it's about them wanting to be progressive, and yet those around them are the ones who are, who are basically not, not being uh, fast enough. My scenario is, is the reverse. What happens in a scenario where the environment is changing too fast for the people to adapt? You know, for example, in the US, there is the way the mayor and the police tend to work hand in hand. Yeah, there is the role of the mayor in policing. That can be replicated or can be compared to our role in this particular place. But what happens in a scenario where maybe we've uh, given them independence because We all, we're all back together now? It looks like we are. All right, so I'm sorry, we got cut off in the, our, last, our last comment from yeah. Sirfred. Um, Wing Kai, how do you wanna proceed with the rest of this? Do you wanna take a little extra time? Yes, I think we can have five, 10 more minutes, but each group should just um, briefly spend two minutes talk about what they have learned. Okay, great. Um, all right, so yeah, so our, our group, we were in the middle of a wonderful comment from Surfred that unfortunately got cut off. Um, uh, so we'd ask Piva to summarize our group's activities. Piva, do you just want to share a, a sort of key takeaway from our group discussion? So in our, our group discussion, we had a lot of different challenges. Uh, 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 our other colleagues, were in, in our other colleagues encounter, like uh, we talk about challenges with uh, selflessness. We talk about challenges with communications. We had a colleague who uh, had um, uh, grew up not knowing how to really communicate and shake it with communication. So how did she overcome this? She just decided that uh, she would keep communicating no matter what. If you understand what she say, you will ask. If you don't understand where you, uh, what you suffer, she will correct it to build her confidence. So building her confidence was able to make her to overcome that uh, obstacles in uh, her communications. And uh, another challenge was uh, getting into work where you are young and you meet a group of your co-workers who have their own ideas on how the wish things should be. And you are getting into such system and you're trying to bring your own change to the system. How to bring them is kind of challenging. You try to meet with your co-workers, you try to bring up communication, interact with them, make them to know that you are not there to take their job. You have come to work along with them as a leader. You recognize your flaws and you care what to identify with them. Let them to know that, oh, okay, I'm not flawless. I have my flaws and I want us to work together. So communication in uh, leadership is one of the key roles. And um, in fighting corruption, we have to be able to have good governance and good leadership that is communication as well. So that's the summary of our discussion. Thank you. Anyone thank you. want to ask? Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, one, one quote from Nolita really stands out for me. She, she was talking about this challenge of being a younger person in authority over older people who were kind of entrenched and thought they knew the right way to do everything. And she found it useful to say, you know, this isn't about me, right? This is about the public good and about public service. I'm not here in this position because I want to have power over you, right? And that's that was a really interesting, I think that summarized a lot of the themes in our discussion, right? A sort of challenge of 
both having that sort of self-confidence, as Pipa mentioned, um, but also, you know, as, as Wendy stressed throughout, having this commitment to the public good and public service and it, it not being about ego. Again, that idea of servant leadership that we introduced last week. Um, Wendy, did you want to say anything else? No, I think that that covers it. It's um, there. There's so much we could go on for for many times. And um, one of the things that I did assure um, our group was that that those conversations, because people are revealing things about themselves, would remain um, confidential. So, thanks, everyone. Thank you. And our second group, Mike. Do you have a, a reporter from your group? Um, Wing and I talked. I, I, I don't know whether Wing wanted to make some comments or uh, we can go to some of our. Yes, I think uh, I'll start and if some of our um, African fellows want to um, particularly emphasize the examples. We, um, Dr. Krasenik asked a question about the, the role of political leadership and how does it influence your country and your work. And um, because uh, of the influence from the top, um, so a lot of the, uh, student, a lot of the fellows were talking about their, the uh, role of democracy in their countries. And we have two groups of countries, certain groups of countries like Liberia and South Africa had a longer history of democratic uh, systems um, in Africa. And they've gone through some changes over the last um, 20 years as well, in, especially in South Africa. Um, so even though the system is there, there's still uh, a work in progress and there's still problems um, in their democracies. Um, and then we got to another group of countries like Zambia, Sierra Leone, or even bigger democracies like Nigeria, where there are a lot of problems of uh, political corruption or political influence, uh, either by individual political leaders or by you know, not sharing the power to the people. And some of the fellows also talk about the lack of power for women in political leadership and political process was cut off for women to participate in the process. Um, so there's still a lot of uh, restrictions and um, you know, uh, limitations for um, political participation. And Dr. Krasenik asked about the question whether our fellows are concerned or passionate about democracy if the, the uh, government is doing well or economically. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of fellows still think that democratic values are important, but they also like the prosperity and stability of the country, which is the concern of uh, the people as a whole. So um, are there any things that I missed that any of the fellows would like to add? Okay, um, I think that was a great summary that uh, you've done. I just want to put in just very quickly, two points. Um, also about the alliance of the appointees and other people in the democratic process. Sometimes uh, one of our colleagues uh, from, from Zambia spoke about uh, when appointment is, is made by the president, you know, when the election is done, you also have some chance to appoint some people, especially the president. And most of the appointments are made based on close relatives. And then those who have been given the power are not accounting to the people. They're supposed to account to the people, but they are more accountable to the president as, as, as it may be. And, and also the point about having a one party dominance in a country uh, like South Africa, we got an example that having one party in charge with uh, uh, non robust opposition, opposition that is weak, uh, could also undermine the process of tracking, the process of accountability, transparency, and other things in the process. So I just wanted to pull in that, but that was really great. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. M Megan, I, ju I just want to say, if, if, there's, if there's hope for democracy in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it is the, the fact that there's this underlying desire and passion to, to have people participate and have their voices heard. And, and we hear that. Uh, from from our our fellows from Liberia, Sierra Leone, Nigeria, Zambia, Djibouti, uh, and Uganda, there, there's there, there's there, there's a passion there. It, it may be stifled occasionally, it may be uh, uh, pushed aside, 
but uh, it still remains a very, very strong view. So I think that that's one of the takeaways that I got out of our discussion today. Uh, and and Binyam, um, so Binyam, I think, was not in your group. He just asked, are we really condemned to go through benevolent dictators as a transition to democracy? Is there no other way? <laughs> right. And so that did that question uh, come up? You, you guys are kind of hinting around that, but what was the take in your group on that question, right? Which is something I, I have heard many people say over the years, right? Um, you know, including in the United States, I think some people would be happy with a benevolent dictator, right? So what's, uh, what were some thoughts on that in your group? I'll let the Any, fellows speak. Yeah, anyone, anyone there can respond, yeah. anyone in group two. I think I can, I can come well, in on uh, that. Huh? Great. Yes. Um, for me, it's, it's not always that we should get through the same route. Types of governance are different. And um, I was just a few days, I was reading through some happenings. Is it in this Swaziland about some, they, what is there now is there is a monarchy, but then people are protesting and we don't know where that would lead. But in essence, um, it's not always that it should be a, through a dictator for you to get through to democracy. But to, to some extent, if that is what is currently prevailing, that is exactly, you have the, that, that leader must be able to provide an opportunity or an environment where democracy is going to thrive. So if you happen to be that, um, lead at that particular time, I would say provide an opportunity or an environment that is going to ensure that democracy actually thrives. Yeah. That, yeah, that raises a really, really interesting current event among many things happening around the world in terms of democracy advocacy right now. Um, okay, so we have another question from Surfred, which is excellent. Do we want to take that or should we move over to Jabril first? Yeah, let's move over to Jibril. Yes. Okay, all right, so Jibril. Let's take the question. Let's take oh, the question. Okay. So if that okay. refers to our group, then yes. Yeah, so yeah, so your, your group has a lot of the provocative debate questions here. So Surfred asks, what is the role of Western democracies in undermining democracy in Africa? As a historian, I could say many things about that, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll hold back. <laughs> um, what, what, do, uh, what do our fellows think about that, right? Because, you know, oft, often we've been talking about sort of international collaboration for democracy promotion, but certainly there have been many historical and contemporary examples where meddling from other countries, particularly Western governments, can make democracy challenging. Any, any thoughts on that? Surfred, you, you raised the question, so if you want to say something more about that too. I, I, I think uh, this is my, just this is maybe just exception. I, I think it would be necessary for those in the West to respond rather than those of us in Africa who have <laughs> perhaps different understanding or perspective about that. You know, maybe there's something that we may be missing. So those in the West, I think they have, will have better reputation to answer that question. That's just, that just my thing. I think we have to look at ourselves in the mirror in the West as well, in the United States. And when we talk yeah. about democracy, it's not just, you know, benevolence and bringing good to the world. And we also imposing our values to the world and in a particular way. And sometimes doing it very uh, aggressively and in a hegemonic way. And the legacy of colonialism in Europe also uh, had a heavy cycling phase in the United States. We were, uh, uh, you know, supporting a lot of wars and colonial legacies in the United States, uh, in Africa as well. So there's a lot of mistrust of outsiders in a lot of African countries, not just uh, towards China, but also towards the West in general. You know, a lot of African nations want independence, want, you know, nationalism, because their countries came out from this colonial history on the most part, except a few, you know, countries that have, you know, shorter history. So I can understand that democracy 
is one, one side of the coin, but there's uh, another side of the coin, which is colonialism, that we also have to look into that. Yeah, I mean, and the, the legacy of the Cold War, I mean, I'm, I'm going to hold back from talking because I could, yeah. since I teach whole courses on this, essentially, yeah. but, you know, if, if we look at the, you know, our fellows from South Africa and from, from Zambia, from the region, know, know the history of Cold War meddling in Southern Africa well, for example, right, which, you know, sustains supposedly exclusively local civil wars in Angola and Mozambique for such a long time, right, there's a, a long history of reckoning that Western governments have to do. Um, Surford also raised this point about multinational corporations and yeah, there's there's a lot a lot to be said about this, right? And so you know, I think that these kind of transnational dimensions put even further strains, right, on on all of us as leaders in our everyday interactions, right? Because clearly, you know, we we in our decisions that we make in our particular jobs can't undo these legacies single handedly, right? But I think Jabril's group is speaking to how community civil engagement, um, that was something that Simche also mentioned, right, the importance of civic education, right, to know about these histories, to know about these legacies, to work to undo them, how can that change our future? So Jabril, do you want to speak to some, some key themes that came up in your group about, you know, how, how we can overcome these legacies of colonialism and the Cold War and everything that's followed uh, through greater sort of grassroots organizing? Megan, real quickly, our, our, our fellows are coming here at the United States at a time in which I think we have to be honest among ourselves about our model of democracy, whether, whether it works, whether we're providing people an opportunity to vote, uh, whether, whether people can have the opportunity to speak up clearly and forcefully, whether our institutions are, uh, are working properly. Uh, whether there is an, in, indeed a, uh, uh, an, an opportunity to, uh, to have an election that is not uh, uh, put in question by, by some individuals. So, uh, you know, we, we, we've had a model that we've, that we've advanced uh, throughout, the, throughout the world in the, in the post-colonial period, and uh, we need to look at ourselves right now, uh, and, and, and maybe our, our fellows will help us to look at ourselves Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and perhaps we need, we need to make some serious adjustments before we start talking about uh, advancing a democratic model that comes out of our traditions. Absolutely. Yeah. Jabril, do you want to speak to, speak to that, speak to what your group was discussing? Well, our, our group was discussing um, community engagement mm -hmm. and uh, also looking at you know, the, the concept we talked about all of the different modules about how you do community engagement that came out of the presentation I did, uh, inviting citizens as core designers, core implementers, or initiators, all of these things being very critical, uh, as well as looking at your psychosocial self, you know, because it is very important for you to really have a good grasp and understanding of your own self-concept, your, your, your self-image, uh, we talked about this, your self-esteem and your self-ideal. Um, these are critical things to understand because the, one of the ways we can ensure some of the mistakes that we all of us made in the past, whether from the West or in Africa, there's, there's been a history and a legacy of all kinds of mishaps and errors and social injustices, economic injustices, one of the ways we can start to actually change those is taking a closer look at who we are as leaders. That whole idea about what is your ideal self? What is your self-concept of being a leader? Because if you're going into leadership to position yourself for success on the backs of other people, we know what's going to happen. Whether you create a nonprofit organization, whether it's in Africa or here, in the United States where we live, if you create a nonprofit organization and your intent is self-promotion and self-success, and you pretty much leverage citizens' vulnerabilities and their, their biases and everything else to get to where you need to be, ultimately, this is the time where, and somebody brought this um, in our conversation, I think it was Cornelius, maybe I, I get this wrong, who said that, no, actually it was Sarah, Sarah in our conversation raised the issue of leaders who engage with the community with a specific goal in mind. They want votes and when they get the votes and get into office, they turn their backs in the community. And Sarah's question was, 
is that community engagement? And I said, absolutely not. That is not the community engagement we're looking for. That is not the community engagement we're talking about. And a lot of time that continue to repeat itself over and over and over. And we are hoping that you guys as the next generation of leaders will actually avoid that pitfall and realize that actually when you engage in community, there are authentic, scientifically proven ways of doing this. How do you make com as ordinary citizens, as core designers, core implementers, and initiators of work? Dr. Jabbar can talk about this. He commented, he made a wonderful comment around creating spaces. How do you create space in a community where people's voices are heard? And I've given the example of, you know, right, you, if it requires for you to go from house to house to talk to people about their concern and collect their ideas and thoughts, to, to work with community leaders, to, to organize community events where you will gather thoughts and ideas and ensure that the people's thoughts and ideas are included in the policy making. Therefore, when the policy is made, the citizen can see themselves in the policy. But if you already have a policy already cooked, baked, ready to go, and you just come to the citizen and you said, well, here is the policy, which was Sarah was talking about, where she said that the government has policies and some funding. And when they invite citizens and community base to participate and voice what they want to see happen, nobody comes, nobody participates. And Sarah's question was, how do we do this? And I said, well, you didn't engage them from the beginning. So pretty much you're coming to them with a policy already baked, ready to go. And the citizens are looking at you just like, we do not see ourselves in this, this policy you're presenting to us. And as a result, people disengage with the community. And hopefully you as leaders will be able to really develop yourself that you don't make the same mistakes that is being made repeated over and over again. I mean, one last thing I would say before I finish, you know, and let's, let's be very candid about this. Democracy is never finished. It's always a work in progress. There is no way in the world where you have a finished complete democracy. It's always a work in progress. And it always changes based on economic situation, demographics, political situation, political parties, so it's always moving with the time. Now, you as leaders, can you learn to adapt and adjust to the changing nature of democracy, not only in your country, but also in our own country, in the West and across the world? That is the question. Ask yourself that question. Don't have this conception that this is democracy, this is it and it's done and it's over with. But keep an open mind this is part of understanding your self-concept and your ideal self. But democracy, my ability to be an effective leader is my ability to adapt to the changing nature of democracy as a system that changes with time, with political leaders, with economic situation, with generational situation. Because if you are able to do that, you will be able to actually find the type of democracy that fit in within the context and speak to the context of what you're doing. In the United States, we have a messy democracy, but it is a democracy. It's always changing. It's messy. We battle it out. Sometimes we agree, we don't disagree, but guess what? That is the beauty and the part of what democracy is because it's a, if we don't, we don't want a democracy that stops set in stone. We want a democracy that we can fight about and battle over and disagree on and have conflicts about and I think that that's what makes the American democracy work because we fight over it. We reinforce certain things and we reinvent it as we go along. So for you leaders in Africa, don't idealize this democracy that is set in stone, but instead learn to adapt to the changing nature of democracy. And the messiness of democracy is actually part of the beauty of what democracy is.
So we thank you so much. So we those are excellent thoughts. We have one one more question from Charles. Um, we'll take it. If you guys need to leave, you can leave. I know we're way over time, but Charles asks a really provocative closing question. How do we apply these concepts as, as citizens, as co-implementators, co-designers, and co-initiators when an organization is already established? Right. So if we're working for you know, a really, a really entrenched organization, how do we apply those principles as opposed to starting something from the ground up? Any, any thoughts on that? Yes, Jabbar. So, thank you so much. Uh, just so, so, you know, I gave an example, mm -hmm. uh, all members of United Nations as countries, mm -hmm. one country, two countries, they initiate something for their countries and other countries. So, in the, you know, take it, locally and engage the local leaders and the citizens. They should be able to initiate something, a project that they feel there is a need for it. Because most of the time, especially in the, you know, most of the, the world where you have authoritarian uh, governments, they think they know more. And so we need to be able to really enable the local leaders uh, create a space for them, as Dr. Jibril mentioned. And of course, we always go to the typical well-known spaces, such as churches, mosques, uh, temples. No, these are for, you know, for worshipers to go. Create public space where people then create what we call it, the community of the willing the willing, those the, the willing, those the initiators, because they will be willing to work with you on that project. So take that the United Nations, look to the history and see most of the really great uh, resolutions uh, and projects from UNICEF, UNESCO came from individual countries. And I, assume, I think based on the evidence now, I think citizen can do the same. So go to your local leaders, engage them, listen to them, not just talk at them, engage them and take their ideas, adopt their ideas and start the work. Without that, I see no engagement. If top down communication, we have to reverse it, grassroots up communication. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for those insights, Jabbar. It's wonderful to have you back with us. Um, so Chisholm has one more question. I'll put that on the discussion board because we're, we're quite over time at this point. But Chisholm asks another excellent question about how we sort of streamline the process to get citizens more involved, whether we're working with an established organization like the United Nations or a newly formed NGO. So thank you all so much. Thank you to our panelists, both for their recording and for our wonderful, fruitful discussion today. I'm sorry again for our technical difficulties. Uh, Wing Kai raised his hand. Do you have an announcement? Or... Yes, I, I like to remind all the fellows next week is we do not have any virtual sessions, but you will be receiving an email from Dr. Megan later today about some of the resources you will be, um, you know, be able to access next week. Um, so that next week you'll be working on your asynchronous sessions, all the videos and um, modules that you have not had a chance to read, and um, all the focus project you're thinking about to do, and all the, um, you know, Excel, Ignite Talk, if you really want to compete for the Ignite Talk mm -hmm. spot for the summit, you have to submit it be before July 7th. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of uh, things you can think about if you want to really present your leadership style to the entire institute, you have to nominate yourself to IREX directly before July 7th. Um, in this group, we will uh, have all of you to have your accountability partner to do your Ignite talk and eventually you will vote for three people uh, to represent this institute and they will have a chance to present in the last week on July 28th. So those are the Ignite Talks and uh, also the community service um, uh, assignments that we, uh, Kemi helped us to uh, sign up. Uh, we will be collecting the last assignments for people. You, if you have not emailed us, you should do it today or tomorrow. Then we'll be finalizing that uh, assignment. There's still some uh, room left for the um, 
for the one on homelessness and for the one on gun violence, unfortunately, the youth and uh, education and the uh, public health are already full, uh, but they are all good. You can learn about all four subjects eventually. So um, I hope I'm not missing. That's so that's, many that's different. It. Again, look, yeah, look, look out for my summary email. Won't, won't miss a detail. Um, so you guys can enjoy catching up and sort of looking ahead next week. And we'll look forward to seeing you again uh, next on Monday, July, or yeah, yeah, Monday, July 12th. That sounds impossibly far away, but yes. Um, keep in far. mind that we will not be, it will be one hour earlier. Mm -hmm. So this yes. week is, we start at 5 GMT and next uh, on July 12th, we'll, uh, at least for July 12th, we start at uh, 4 GMT. Uh, when you schedule your appointment with your uh, um, coach, uh, if there's a conflict with the session, uh, you should re reschedule your, your meeting with your coaches. So you will be attending our virtual session together as a group. And again, if anyone is having trouble getting in touch with their coach, uh, please reach out to me. I've heard a lot of good feedback. I you know, haven't, haven't heard many negative things yet. That doesn't, of course, mean everything is fine. So please don't be shy if you have any concerns, and I can help facilitate your connections with your coach. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good week next week. We'll See look you forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all so much. Thank you.